Hey everybody, Matt Coldlazer here. Jill Bienda. And we are in episode two of the Liquor Store Podcast. So Jill, let's start with a segment that we're gonna call, what are what did you really drink? What are you really drinking? Um, so it's Labor Day weekend this past weekend, uh, which is kind of like- Lots the, of opportunities. The, week, the, <laughs> the weakest of all weekends, I don't know. To me, it's, it's like the- it's like the ho- the forgotten holiday. But <laughs> it's a day off, nevertheless. It is a day off. It's Christmas. time for f- fun and family. I had to go to a wedding, uh, so but I'll let you start. What did you really drink this past week? Let's see. So um, I began my Friday night with some wine. I think I drank uh, some Barbera, actually. Mm. Um, it was a leftover sample. It was delicious. Um, and then on Saturday, I went to a friend's party where they had um, a pretty good spread of a whole bunch of really bad decisions. Um, and I actually went with the Italian white, which was, you know, I know we talked about that last week, but, um, you know, I went with the Italian white and it was actually really, um, really tasty. I was really surprised because it was a catered event and usually you don't get so many good options, but this particular, um, it was a lobster bake. Um, this was really fancy and had really great wine. Um, and then on Sunday, I did a Mexican fiesta. Um, anyway, so that's what I was drinking. Yeah. How many tequilas did you drink? I actually had two different ones. So I had the Fortaleza uh, Still Strength, which is like 110 proof. Yeah, that seems like a smart idea. <laughs> but it's delicious. It's mm-hmm. my favorite one. Um, and then I had... Uh, Oh, it was a it was a new one that I've never had before. Um, man, I'm totally blanking on it. Um, it has a like it has a bottle like every other all the other ones, but it was a blanco. I'm a blanco fan. Um, I just like the pure agave spirit. I like to taste a little bit of that um, like aloe citrus notes to it. I'm okay with the aging, but I just like it. So you can sip uh, Blanca tequila, no problem. I can. And you don't put ice in it? You don't... Oh, I do put ice in okay. it. Okay, yeah. a little ice, maybe like a little lime? Or... A little lime, um, and then maybe a, just a splash of like citronage or, you know, maybe, it's you know, it's kind of like a easier version of a margarita. <laughs> so you had some Italian wine and tequila. Yes. And some other <laughs> white wine. Yes. <laughs> Sounds like a good weekend. It was, it was fun, it was relaxing. Nice. I rearranged my pantry. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting life of Jill. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what did I drink? Well, I went to a wedding in Covington, which is right across the river from Cincinnati, uh, which is really interesting because it's like on one side is Ohio, which is Ohio, very Indiana ish, but then you go to the <laughs> other side and voila, it's like the south. Literally, like there's a bridge and then the architecture changes, everything changes, and you're in Kentucky. So, uh, we were in Covington for a wedding, and I followed your tip. I got white wine at the <laughs> wedding, which was Woodbridge Chardonnay. Fine, that's a that's a wedding wine, and it was good. And I think it was a better choice than the than the Cabernet. So I had that. Well, actually, I had a double Woodford. <laughs> Here's my thing. Like, I, <laughs> Gotta get started right. <laughs> so I really like to try a lot of stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just like the habit I've developed over a long period of working here. Sure. So I'm one of those people who, it, it looks probably worse than it is, but I you know, I might have three or four drinks going at the same time. That doesn't mean I'm like <laughs> shooting, I'm like, I didn't right. like drink the whole Woodford. Right. I was sipping on it and then I was like, okay, well before, before this kicks in, I would like to maybe try some <laughs> white wine because I'm gonna switch foods. Okay, that's great. So I got a white wine and I was like, Ah, oh, you know what looks really good over there? Somebody got a beer. And they had <laughs> self-serve beer stations, which was great. Oh, like for a funny. wedding, I think it was like a golf course kind of catering hall thing. Um, but the the taps were all self-serve. So if you wanted a beer, you just go up and like pour yourself a beer. That's you don't neat. have to wait in line or anything like that. What was, kind of what kind of beer did they have on tap? Uh, they had this is how alcohol nerdy I am. <laughs> I really know all of them. Uh, they they had Bud Light, of course. They had Mick Ultra, which you would expect from like a golf course bar to have that. Sure. They had Fat Tire, which nobody was drinking, which, I mean, like, I don't know. Don't, don't you know remember when it came across the, the Mississippi? It was the biggest deal yeah. <laughs> way back in the 90s. Right, and, 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 and so was Coors Banquet like 40 years ago. <laughs> uh, then they had um, uh, Blue Moon. And I think Budweiser, and then one other one. But 
uh, yeah. Oh, what did I have? Did I they had, have any they had Yingling lager. Oh, I was going to say, did they have any like local? I mean, no, they had no Rheingeist, which no. is kind of surprising. Yeah. It's like a golf course. So I had a Mick Ultra. This is how I am with Mick Ultra, okay? <laughs> the There's water. like a regret. Yeah, I always have a regret midway through a Mick Ultra where I'm like, <laughs> man, I was really going to make a great decision here. I'm going to drink this Mick Ultra. I'm gonna really be good, and then halfway through, I just give up. I'm just kind of like, I want a beer. I don't want this Mick Ultra. I want a real beer. I want a real beer. So then I get another. So basically, I drink like half a Mick Ultra, <laughs> which is like a quarter of a real beer, and then I just drink a real beer. So I mean, literally, like that happens probably eighty percent of the time. I try I mean, to. I feel like the thought was there, so you should get the points for. The decision yeah. was made. <laughs> so at one point during the wedding, which I think Lori's like relatives were kind of judging me, I had like a glass of white wine, a beer, and a and a Woodford <laughs> in my general vicinity. Well, you know, like but I didn't finish all of them, them, and that's the key. Mm -hmm. You know, we call it sips, right? And the fine art of sips. And a lot of people don't know how to do sips, especially <laughs> at weddings. Right. And uh, you got to do sips, <laughs> just a little bit. It's all you need. So. Uh, what else? So then, uh, after I did sips, then <laughs> my what was my nightcap? We got back to the Airbnb, and I had a Guinness, which is just my like I have a Guinness every week, no matter what. It's good for you. No matter what nutrients and stuff. <laughs> I'll have a Guinness, a pub can Guinness, and then I had a Dalmore cigar malt. And I was going to smoke a cigar, but then I was like, oh, if I smoke a cigar, then Lori's not going to like that. Then the next day I'm going to stink. It'll be terrible. So I did. So I had two cigars yesterday when I went golfing. Well, you know, that it was appropriate yesterday. Yeah. But I didn't eat the fried chicken. Oh, that was the best thing there. was there. like that fried chicken slider, and I didn't have that. So I, I did everyone. It was delicious. So I had the cigar. And the girl was like, you're trying to make a healthy choice. <laughs> you have a cigar hanging out of your mouth. You're, yeah. You're an idiot. So <laughs> that's par for the course for me. Okay, so that's what that's what I've been that's what I drank pretty much last weekend. Um, and like I said, I really like to start the weekend. After a Saturday long exercise, I'll have a Guinness or a beer or something. That's like that's but that's actually, I read a, an article that said that drinking a beer after exercising is just as hydrating as drinking water. What about drinking beer while exercising? That's just not fun. What did the I article mean, say? Filling all over. <laughs> I don't think we didn't get into that particular practice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, well, I still have a small child. And one, one time, so I don't know, Lori, beer no, Lori walked away or something and, and he was in the bath and I like I had a beer and I was at that critical <laughs> I was at like that critical decision point I'm like okay do I put the beer down on the counter like this is my first beer okay this is not like my ninth beer <laughs> do I put this first beer down on the counter and just go finish the bath or do I take my beer and like set it on the bathroom floor and finish the bath while the beer is there <laughs> I won't say which one I did <laughs> We'll but just I use our I, imagination, but I, I guess. Think, but I think you know. <laughs> Did you at least have a koozie on it? <laughs> no. But that's as close as I've gotten to like a shower beer. Oh, well, you know. <laughs> I can't judge for that. No, no. So that's what we're drinking. Um, a, a weird mix of everything. Everything. Which is great. <laughs> All right, so let's get on to today's topic. And we're going to cover two topics that I think people will be really interested in. Um, the first one is the top seven bourbons in the known universe. Wow. This is, um, this is like <laughs> from a solid 12 years of being completely 100% immersed in this universe. And um, this is my, this is really what I think. So I'm going to go for it. <laughs> Putting it all out there. Yeah, I'm going to go for it. Because... Uh, we talked a little bit about this last time about how people are starting to sort of fetishize these particular brands and mm -hmm. you know they've got to get up plans with the, the dump date that matches their child's you know birthday and all these like super hyper specific things <laughs> and the only brands that they can buy are you know Elmer T. Lee and, and you know Eagle Rare single barrels but they won't even look twice at these other things so 
this is my attempt to kind of right the ship a little bit and, and put a little perspective out there that is that has a little bit of experience behind it. Um, I mean, it, you know, I, I believe that Indiana is the number two consuming whiskey state in the country. <laughs> okay, we'll go with that. Okay, I'm going to say it with confidence. It's the number two consuming state. <laughs> um, and uh, I, it's, it's funny because I am from Chicago and there's a lot of people there who now drink whiskey. They didn't drink it, you know, 15 years ago. And uh, there's a lot of opinions about it. And just because they live in a big city, um, a lot of people think that they, you know, have had more bourbon. But I have to say, since moving down here to Indianapolis, there's been a much wider selection of bourbon or whiskey in general. And also a lot of people, oops, um, I mean, they, they, they really kind of do know their stuff and they really do trust your palate. So I'm excited to see what these are. Well, I thank you. I don't think people should trust anybody's palate because everybody's nope. palate's like super different um, all the time. But, um, and you're in my own palate, anybody's palate be different on different days after you've had one or two, your palate's different. So um, what something really tastes like, again, it's, it's pretty, it is really subjective, I think. And that's why you should always drink in the morning. <laughs> Around 10 a.m., that is, that is accurate. So, all right, here goes. So this is my, so if there's, there are really what I would consider seven major distilleries in the state of Kentucky um, that produce uh, lots of different brands. And then there's hundreds, if not now, thousands of other brands beyond that from what I would call not major, maybe mid-major, maybe, you know, like Michter's now is probably getting to the point where you might say, okay, that's kind of a mid-major brand. Um, but there's really only seven that produce, you know, hundreds of thousands of nine meter cases of product and millions in the case of some of them. So I'm just gonna go through what I think are the best overall examples of bourbon from each one of these major distilleries. Um, so we'll start with the biggest one, uh, which is Jim Beam. And what I always, people ask me uh, what, what if, if somebody says, what are, what's your favorite bourbon? I will give one of these answers because one of these on any given day is the best example from that particular distillery, in my opinion. Okay, um, and all of these, I went and got right off the shelf. I didn't have to wait <laughs> for it. They weren't allocated. You could pretty much get it anytime, all the time. So those are my favorite whiskeys. <laughs> and, well, what I think is, in addition to being, in, in addition to exploring a bunch of different whiskeys and waiting for and getting allocated stuff. Um, you ought to be able to have this stuff on your back bar and drink it on a regular basis. So for every Elmer T. Lee that you're lucky enough to get a hold of, you ought to have five nights where you're drinking Buffalo Trace. You can buy Buffalo Trace anytime you want. It's bourbon. It's delicious. It's mm -hmm. eight years old. It's actually older than Blanton's. Um, it's a great example. But anyway, back to Jim Beam. So uh, I didn't pick Jim Beam white. I didn't pick Jim Beam Black, which used to have an eight-year age statement, um, that's sort of the that's obviously the number one bourbon in the world, Jim mm -hmm. Beam, by volume. Uh, I picked another brand that's in their stable that they produce called Old Granddad, and this is their Bottled and Bond version. Uh, so I won't go into the whole Bottled and Bond uh, history; that'll be for another <laughs> podcast. But um, essentially, what it guarantees is, the, is that the product is at, at minimum four years old and bottled at 100 proof. Why is that good? Well, um, at four years, um, all of the kind of new makes, any kind of note of new make is sort of blown away. Uh, the caramel, the toffee, the sweetness, the sugar is really in the whiskey at that point. It's transferred from the barrel wood into the distillate. So it's there, like the elements are there. And then at 100 proof, uh, that's, you know, it's not the perfect proof for everything. You know, like Woodford, <laughs> Woodford, Woodford tastes good at 90 proof. Um, some things don't taste as good to me at barrel strength. So once something gets above 125, uh, you're, it's, <laughs> sometimes it's just like, 
just to be barrel proof for the sake of being barrel proof. Yeah, it's, it's kind not, of a party trick. Yeah, it's not necessary. I mean, there's, you know, there's the George T. Stags of the world, but you know, there's only really one George T. Stag. So, I go for Old Granddad Bottle and Bond, hundred proof. It's under twenty five bucks. You can buy it any day of the week. To me, this is the exemplar of Jim Beam, and Jim Beam runs two major plants. There's one in Claremont where the visitor center is, and there's one in Boston, which nobody's allowed to go to. Um, and Boston does a ton of production, I think, for most of the white and a few other things. So, um, yeah. So anyway, I go for the OGD <laughs> and uh, the picture, the old uh, granddad that's actually on the bottle, that's actually a picture of Basil Hayden. So. People want to know where the Basil Hayden brand comes from. There's a history there, and, <laughs> and Old Granddad is connected to that. Um, so anyway, Old Granddad for a long time was kind of considered bottom shelf to some degree. Yeah. A little bit forgotten bonded whiskeys, which have seen a resurgence, thanks in part mostly to Bernie Lubers from Heaven Hill oh, yeah. uh, and, and a lot of other, you know, a lot of other people, but. Um, they become more and more popular now and people are seeing the value in that for your age statement, that proof, and the price point. So, um, if people ask me what my favorite Jim Beam is, this is what I say. OGD, <laughs> 100 proof, no problem. All right, the next one is a different mash bill. It's weeded bourbon and it's owned by the same company. So, Beam Suntory is uh, the official name of this company. It was purchased by Suntory, a Japanese company, a couple years ago. Um, but it's Maker's Mark, and this is Maker's Mark. It's not Maker's 46. It's this not- This is a personal favorite of mine. <laughs> it's not cask strength. It's not one of the single barrel variants uh, or the, the mixed blend uh, bear, uh, stave project that you can do. It's not that, it's not that, it's not that. It's old school, 90 proof, Maker's Mark. And there, act, there was actually some controversy a few years ago when they they quietly tried to change the proof to 86, I think. They Yeah, they were going to change the proof. They were going to like water it down a little bit. and But they decided they wanted to be transparent about it because other whiskeys had not been so transparent about it and just did it. But then the people, the people spoke. They were upset. So then they didn't do it. <laughs> well... In my mind, that was the best whiskey that Maker's Mark has ever produced. Really? Yeah. Their, their slightly lower proof version of their regular Maker's Mark was actually the perfect bourbon that they've ever made. The people went nuts and said, oh, they're, you know, you're getting... They're greedy. Yeah, they're greedy. <laughs> and all that's true, you know, you, they would have made more money. When you're talking about brands that do hundreds of thousands of cases, if you can squeeze an extra couple bucks out of a case, um, that's millions of dollars. Nevertheless, I don't know why people didn't try it because it was delicious. I mean, right. the thing to me about Maker's Mark is, okay, it's weeded, so it's a little bit on the sweeter side. So it's a little bit more of an accessible whiskey for folks. But um, it does, it to me, it does tend to be a little, a little bit young. So it's a tad spicy. So when they proofed it down a notch, it was unbelievable. So... Whatever, it doesn't matter. I mean, you can proof it down with like an eye droplet of water. <laughs> it's super easy That's to do. That's how I do it. <laughs> and I would venture to guess that, you know, most people are drinking Maker's Mark at 86 proof or way lower than that because the majority of folks are gonna put this with ice. Right. Or in, a, in whatever. So it's gonna be less than 86 proof in about 15 <laughs> seconds after it hits, <laughs> you know, your big rock ice cube. Um, and that's just the that's just the deal. So most people are drinking it at lower proof anyway. So uh, say what you want, but this Maker's Mark mash bill, this weeded mash bill, is absolutely bulletproof, and um, it's got a nice kind of rustic corn to it as mm -hmm. well. I think that really comes through because it's not super old. It doesn't have these like massive layers of oak spice all over it. So. Um, it's two things. It's kind of refreshingly young and also quaint and old-fashioned at the same time. So I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of Maker's Mark, and I really love that they hand-dip every bottle. 
Yeah, I don't know. I've never really believed that. I've seen it with my own eyes right. many, many times. I've seen these like women on their shift dipping the balls. I'm like, oh, that's bullshit. There's no way. Where's the robot over, right? overlord like <laughs> dipping these bottles? Well, I wouldn't believe that. I wouldn't believe it. Yeah, I mean, it's a beautiful. It's, it? Yeah, it's kind of a <laughs> bourbon. It's kind of a bourbon Disneyland in Loretto, out in the middle of nowhere. It's pretty cool, but yeah, you just cannot beat classic everyday maker's mark. And again, these are not like. These are not meh yeah. bourbons, okay? No. If you're a bourbon drinker and you're on all the private groups and all that stuff, and no, you, no, try these bourbons. They're mm -hmm. good. They're really good. Don't be a hipster about it. Well, yeah, just, <laughs> just try. Well, yeah, be whatever you want, but try these and keep trying them so your palate grows and your palate will change over the years and you'll like different ones over time, but anyway. I only say so, that because I've, I've been a hipster about it. So. Yeah. So that's Beam <laughs> Suntory. Uh, you know, all the Jim Beam whiskeys, Old Granddad, Knob Creek, Bakers, Bookers, um, Maker's Mark, uh, and all the scotches they own now. So it's pretty cool. Love Maker's Mark. Okay. Now yeah. this one. Let's see, I'm excited about this one. This one it was actually my personal favorite for a long time um, that I would say is one that a lot of people haven't tried but should this is old forester under proof and uh, this is like the progenitor to modern woodford reserve the dna and the bones of woodford are in this bottle and if you go to kentucky the two top selling bourbons in the state of kentucky are handles of Old Forester 86. Think about that. That's. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> real bourbon drinking. Yeah. The handle of Old Forester. <laughs> Could you drink a handle of bourbon? No, you can't. No, I can't. I can't. Because you're weak. <laughs> I'll, I'll try harder. <laughs> that's right. I'm just saying, like, who drinks a hand? Those are people who just really like bourbon. That's their culture. You can't, like, you're not going to buy a handle of anything. Unless you're serious about it. What do most people buy handles of in this universe? Vodka. Tito's. <laughs> exactly. No, these people don't buy handles of Tito's. They buy, well, they do, but they buy <laughs> handles of Old Forester. And then the number one seller in dollars is Woodford. And they both come from Brown Foreman. Um, so can you explain, like, the bones of Woodford being this bottle? Like, what, is, what does that mean? Well, Woodford is, I mean, they've got a distillery in Shively. Brown Foreman does that's in the middle of um, kind of a rougher part of town and they've got brick warehouses there it's on the other side of the tracks mm, so to speak yeah <laughs> um, which is also a beautiful facility to tour and do like an old Forester single barrel selection at or whatever um, as one does yeah I mean it's <laughs> it's in the middle of the city it is in the middle of the city right smack dab surrounded by homes and um, and there's a lot of tradition to that. I mean, um, DSP KY uh, 1 6, which um, <laughs> is where the original Pappy Van Winkle actually worked, who was a salesperson, he wasn't a bourbon maker. Um, that's down there. And um, uh, Heaven Hill has a facility down there that used to be owned by United Spirits. But anyway, there's big major distilleries uh, that, that are right in the heart of the city and then they also own this um, they also own the facility in Versailles which is in the middle of horse country which is gorgeous you know it's got these <laughs> what what I think is you know what I think is interesting about it is, is that where the bluegrass grows well here's the deal I mean it it's it's this Oscar pepper it's these place this historic site where all these major innovations happened in bourbon and thank god brown foreman you know this privately held company had enough money that when they were going to re that they were going to do the woodford brand and they were going to use juice that they had on hand you know because old forester has been around forever they're going to turn this into woodford reserve they they did it right and they made this beautiful place in the middle of horse country and so when people go out there they're like oh this is bourbon this is like pastoral but the bones of all that are in downtown Louisville, city bourbon. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like this is this is the part about 
some of the marketing in the bourbon industry. It's like a perfect metaphor for that. It's all good. There's nothing bad about it. It's just they're presenting this very pastoral thing. And I would venture to say that if they had to do it all over again, so when you go into the heart of Woodford, I don't know if you've been there or not, but... I have not been to Woodford. What you'll see is three Scottish pot stills. That's what they have there. Uh, when you go to the new Old Forester experience, which is on Whiskey Row, right in downtown Louisville, there is a massive, it's not massive, it, it's a functioning, relatively decorative column still, which is how bourbon is really made. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't make bourbon corn distillate in pot stills. Mm -mm. So the, the, seat, the key central metaphor at, in the middle of Woodford are these fucking Scottish <laughs> pot stills, which nobody makes bourbon in pot stills. I mean, they do some, <laughs> they do make some special stuff there. I mean, granted, and it, it helps people kind of romantically understand the distillation process, and it's sort of telling a story, but that's, that's kind of what it is. I would, my point is this. <laughs> I would venture to say that if they had to do it all over again, if they were going to redo Woodford now, they would probably put a column still in because people are like, they get the bourbon process. There's not newbies anymore. Like they understand that these things are made in column stills. They respect that. They think it's interesting. Obviously, they're gorgeous, sort of steampunk esque uh, pieces of machinery where this deliciousness flows out of. So, um, I have no problem with Scottish pot stills. I, <laughs> I love Scotch. I love Scotch. I love Irish whiskey. But that's really not how bourbon is made. So. Anyway, what I tell people is, you love Woodford, Woodford's great, obviously. Go back and buy a bottle of 100 Proof Old Forester, George Garvin Brown. And if you're jonesing for Old Forester <laughs> birthday bourbon, which is the first of the allocated nuttiness that's about to happen to us, go back and grab this off the shelf. Put it in your daily, weekly drink rotation. You will not regret it. Uh, it's just a nice little drop of brown sugar it's 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 just really it's balanced if this has got like if the old granddad's kind of got that yeasty um barrel spice this is this is just sweet brown sugar this is a little that kind of sweet wheat and uh, sweet corn this corniness to it so they're all a little bit different and it's it helps you know so anyway that is what i think is the best product that brown Horman Old Forester, 100 proof. <laughs> Prove me wrong. Okay, now I'm on a roll. All right. Now I'm getting really excited here. Um, all right, my next one is from Heaven Hill. And Heaven Hill makes a ton of brands, but the one that I think is the very best of these is Evan Williams Single Barrel. <sighs> this is 86.6 .6 proof. Um, Let's see, this one was barreled on March 29th, 2011, and bottled in November of 18. So um, these are all single barrels. Um, they have a similar age profile uh, to the regular Buffalo Trace. They are unbelievably delicious. And the single barrels are exactly what they say. They're just one barrel. They're not blended, maybe? No, they're not. Right. They're one barrel. There's one barrel. The, the, the that was like the time and place, and that's what happened to that distillate. Yeah, it's a little weird because I think people talk about single barrel programs, and then they talk about the batching, and they don't... That, that little bit of marketing never matches up. I think we've talked about this a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, privately. But what I've always, <laughs> but what I've said is, how can you have all these delicious single barrels that taste so good and so different on their own? And they'll say, so you'll go to the warehouse and you're picking it out, and the tour guide will say, well, you know, two barrels that have lived their whole lives right next to each other can taste totally different. You go, oh yeah, yeah, that's a good point. That's exciting. <laughs> and then, uh, and then you'll go to the next guy, the, the plant manager, will go. Yeah, we uh, we really have a we have a whole team, a whole tasting panel team dedicated to when we dump two hundred to five hundred barrels together that the profile stays the same. So you have these two <laughs> things. You have the, again, it's kind of like the it's like the Woodford Old Forester thing. You have these two sort of opposing things going on where they're saying, 
all single barrels, barrels in bourbon are unique and all these, and then once we put, throw all these unique things together, they taste the same every time. So I don't know what to believe. It doesn't really matter. I have always just found over the years that Evan Williams single barrel is the best tasting thing that Heaven Hill does. <laughs> and, you know, it's not allocated. It's not popular. It doesn't get a lot of credit. But because it's a single barrel, I mean, is it different? Right, so I'm, I'm saying it's a it's, single barrel. It's, it's $29.99. But it's different every time, right? That's a theory. Okay, it's good every time Okay. to me. Okay. I mean, yeah. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course there's going to be a little bit of variation. And there was always a little bit of controversy of that when, um, like when bourbon publications give these huge awards to like single barrels that there's only 200 bottles of them in the world. You're like, no, that's great. Right. S slow clap for that. <laughs> Why they do that, I don't know. Yeah. But, that's my issue with the single barrels that, you know, it's a very limited thing. And, you know, I had a single barrel that still haunts my dreams and I'm never going to have it again. And it kind of makes me sad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other thing about memory. I don't know. I think it's a human thing where it's like things were better than, you know, pre-prohibition or pre-Castro Cuban <laughs> cigars or what. I mean, like, none of that's, none of that's true. It's right. just human nature. Right. We just sent, we're sentimental. We are. And it's just how it is. So that's okay, though. All right. So those are the four right there. Let's move on to number five. Um, this one is probably an easier selection. Like, this is one that's kind of a no-brainer. This classic. Is, yeah, one hundred and one. The OG. It's got a, I think, six to eight year. Again, I mean, you're gonna start to see some themes develop. Uh, everything's at least over four years old. Probably OGD is a four. The makers is like a five to six year age profile. This is an eight. Buffalo Trace is an eight. This is a seven to eight. So we're all kind of in the same strike zone in terms of flavor and price. But Wild Turkey 101, Jimmy and Eddie Russell have been the, the keepers of this forever. Um, that's oh. enough. Yeah, that's another thing <laughs> that we should probably talk about at some point is this, the, the myth of the master distiller. Because right. the only time I've ever seen master distillers is I'm just giving tours the people who work at these plants are like, the people who actually make the bourbon, first of all, the computer makes the bourbon, so let's get that straight. So there's like a software engineer who's written software for, you know, when this, the temperature and when they mash in and all that. Not, not a lot's done by hand. I think New Riff maybe has a system that does it by hand, but anyway, the term master distiller is just a marketing term, I think. Uh, you can be a master distiller and do a, a ton of marketing, I suppose. A lot of it is selling. <laughs> so anyway, uh, Wild Turkey 101, um, this to me is, has been, um, it, it's, it's a little bit on the wood side of things for me. It's not as sweet as the Old Forester. It's not as sweet as the Evan Williams. It's not as sweet as the Maker's Mark, um, but it's got that nice kind of deep leather note I sort of I sort of harken back to like uh, used bookstores I don't know if that does that metaphor even work anymore I mean I, I get what you're saying because I like old bookstores um, you know as a fellow English major yeah. um, <laughs> but what I have to I, what I say about wild turkey is that there's definitely always a thread through all of their bourbons and I'm not sure if they make anything less than like 96 proof. Did they make anything? That's oh, they like made the that. Yeah, there was an 81 proof. An 81 proof. I mean, and it failed miserably in the market. Nobody wanted it. Because I don't, I feel like their stuff's always pretty high proof. Um, pretty mm -hmm. um, spicy. Yeah, a lot of wood. Um, and yeah, definitely a dry, can I say a drier style yeah, of bourbon? Yeah, I think that's right. <laughs> um, I'd go with that. Yeah, um, it's always kind of a cheap date for me. I mean, I like it, but it, yeah, I can only have like one or two with it. I'm, right. I'm done. <laughs> yeah, but 101 is great. And the other, you know, the other thing about this is pretty much like any half decent bar in the U.S. now, or at least in our area, will have all of these. Mm -hmm. So if you're in an airport, if you're traveling or whatever, and you just ask for 101, you're going to get a great pour. It doesn't, you know, that's. I think they even serve it on the airplane, which seems kind of suspect. Yeah. 
That's my choice. <laughs> I, try to, I try not to drink on airplanes. <laughs> try being the operative word there. Okay, let's move on to one of another one of my personal favorites. Obviously, <laughs> these, these are all, all your, all your these are all my favorites, <laughs> but I love this one. I have called it Yellow Label for so long, but it's Four Roses, and I guess you would just call this. I don't know. I guess you'd just call this 80 proof at this point. But um, what was what was Four Roses Yellow Label forever is now um, is now this more like tan label, but uh, <laughs> beige. <laughs> beige. Four Roses beige. Uh, this is a this is a vatting of all of their mash bills. There's 10 mash bills. Uh, well, there's two mash bills and five yeast. So there's 10 distinct bourbons. Mm -hmm. They dump them all together. So as much as I love Four Roses single barrels, um, when you mash them up like this, and then you drop it down to 80 proof, um, you get just a very easy, delicious tasting bourbon. This is probably the least challenging to drink of all of these. I would agree. It's the lightest. It's the most fun. It's the most straightforward, but you can, the DNA of all that flavor is still there. It's the whiskey that's always down to have a good time. Yeah. And the Seagram's kind of, the QC, the, the quality control that, that existed in Seagram's for, you know, 50 years when it ruled the liquor universe, <laughs> it's here. It's in this bottle. That's what's great about the history of whiskey is that if something was good 60, 50, 60 years ago, you know, they're maintaining that. It's like Wild Turkey 101. Their goal is to maintain whatever was good about it 30, 40 years ago mm -hmm. and keep it the same. And that's their goal. Maker's Mark, um, Bill Samuels would tell you the exact same thing. Is Our goal is not to screw it up. Right. Um, yeah, they're, um, I mean, just the tasting panels at all of these places is kind of amazing. Like, they know when something's just a little bit off. They're like, yeah, no, this one's not so great. <laughs> right. Got to tweak it a little bit. But with, with but with batches that are these these the size of these batches, I think they've got enough leeway that if a few bad barrels get dumped in there, it's not going to ruin it. I mean, alcohol this alcohol is very powerful. I mean, it can <laughs> absorb. Yeah, I mean, you could <laughs> you could dump a barrel of iced tea into most of these vats, and your average lay person would not know. <laughs> not that they do that, but I'm just saying this is true. Um, it can take a lot of punches. All right, um, the last one of the seven big ones in Kentucky is Buffalo Trace. So this is the one that I would say, my God, when you when all the all of the hardcore folks want stuff from mm -hmm. Sazerac, they want Elmer T. Lee, they want Elmer T. Lee hundredth anniversary, they want Blanton's, they want Stag, they want Pappy. I mean, all of it comes from the same place. It comes from Sazerac. Distillery, which used to be the ancient age distillery, um, which I think maybe was the George D. Stag distillery at some point. It's gone through a lot of iterations back in the day when people didn't care, uh, when it was pretty run down in the 80s and they weren't producing, uh, they didn't have a, a when, serious visitor center. Back when vodka was cool. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and so this has managed to survive. And it's another one at 90 proof, uh, right around eight years old. So it is a little bit older than Blanton's. Um, but you can't beat this stuff. Oh, no. I've, I've been enjoyed many a bottle yeah. of Buffalo Trace. Yeah, so. it's right. You know, this one. This one's right in the strike zone. Uh, it's it's similar to Wild Turkey. And it, to me, it's like in between. If you combine Wild Turkey and Four Roses, you would get Buffalo Trace. I think that's a fair assessment. So it's I, got the fruit, mm -hmm. but it's also got the leather and the spice and the herbaceousness. Um, but I also like how like light it is on your palate. It's like not cloying, which, yeah. which is kind of what Maker's Mark does sometimes. So this is like my winter, like in front of the um, fireplace on my bearskin rug kind of, you know, whiskey. Whereas like this is more of like, you know, summer and like, you know, put some lemonade in it or, you know. Summer on your bearskin rug. You know, <laughs> <laughs> up in northern Wisconsin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. That's what I think. If you have, if you're gonna pick one bourbon 
from the seven major bourbon distilleries. Buffalo Trace from Buffalo Trace from Sazerac, Wild Turkey 101 from Wild Turkey, which is Campari, an Italian company, um, uh, Maker's Mark, which is uh, from Maker's Mark Distillery in Loretto, um, uh, which is Beam Suntory, Japanese company, Old Forester, which is Brown Foreman, still privately held by the Brown family. Very test. I hope not. <laughs> uh, who is the Who's the last chair? You know, you you know you come from money when your first name is Owsley. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, and uh, Evan Williams Single Barrel from Heaven Hill, privately held by the Shapira family. So those are great because these are like Louisville based family companies that own a ton of brands worldwide and do amazing. Old Granddad. Beam Suntory again, and then Four Roses, uh, which is Kieran, I believe, a Japanese company. So right. three of these are from Japanese companies. Uh, oddly enough, when Japan had a super thirst for aged bourbon back when it was kind of slumping in the 80s and 90s here, the Japanese were drinking lots of bourbon, and so it's no surprise that some of that ownership and has has passed on and it still, it still exists. Two privately held, an Italian company, uh, and, an, and another American company in the case of Sazerac. So a nice multicultural mix for <laughs> the, the world of bourbon that exists. <laughs> so anyway, if these seven bourbon, if, you, if you're asking about Blanton's every other week and you don't have these seven bourbons on your back bar, uh, what are you doing? You got to have these and you got to drink them on a regular basis. That's just my opinion. So... So you're saying don't be a hipster about it. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying that. I'm saying um, fetishize all you want. You know, be really into bourbon. I think it's awesome. I think it's really cool. Um, but also part of that, part of the stewardship of being into something and loving something is understanding where it comes from and understanding the history and being able to go back with your palate and with your your memories when you've been to these distilleries and and appreciate them for everything they make, not just like the highly allocated stuff. So that's just how I feel about it. I'm sure people feel differently, but that's that's the way I feel. And then they so, can start their own podcast. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then um, this is a, a project that the, the guys from Cardinal Spirits have been working on for a while. Uh, it's called Krogman's. It's actually an old Indiana brand from Tell City, Indiana, and uh, it's it's bottled MGP product from Lawrenceburg, Indiana, and we've, we've maybe chatted about this a few times, and we can go more into depth on MGP in another episode, but all I would say is, if there's seven major Kentucky bourbon distilleries, uh, no list is complete without some kind of bourbon from MGP, which is made in Indiana. Obviously, Lots of craft brands source product from there. Um, it's been around for a long, long time, uh, longer than many of these others, and uh, it is still a vital, and I mean lifeblood, vital part of the emergence of craft brands and the emergence of interest in whiskey, experimentation in terms of barrel finishing, and just like plain old good product. Um, this is also an offshoot of the old Seagram's Empire. So the quality control that you would find in Four Roses is the same as every bottle of High Rye uh, MGP that's out there. So I think MGP bourbon at a younger age tastes better than a lot of bourbons. So you can get a three and four year old MGP and uh, it, it tastes complete. <coughs> and also the uh, the proof, 90 proof, 100 proof, is perfect for that for those particular recipes. And they're high rye can't be beat. I mean, they're 36% rye. Yeah. Some of the most drinkable stuff in the universe. Like the Krogmans, which I actually find to be quite pleasant. Yes. At, even at 90 proof, and I'm kind of a wuss when it comes to whiskey and <laughs> fire water. <laughs> right. Um, now I really, actually really enjoy Krogmans quite a bit. So that's it. I think that is the blueprint for anybody who wants to really enjoy bourbon is start, start with these seven and then if you're 10 five ten years into it 
go buy D7 again and make sure you buy new bottles of it and make sure you open them up and drink them and enjoy it. Oh, that's another question. Like how, does bourbon go bad when it's opened? I mean, I would assume no, but then... I think it can oxidize over the course of 20, 30, 40, 50 years. If, you know, you had some at a wedding and you left an inch in the bottle or something like that and it's been in the cabinet for 30 years, it will, it will oxidize a little bit. I mean, not like wine, but um, <laughs> it will over time. And some, some I think, can more than others. It just sort of depends on the batch or whatever's in that particular bottle. But no, I mean, for the most part, you can open a bottle and have it open off and on for, you know, a decade or so, and you're not going to notice anything in general. Most people won't. <laughs> so, <Maybe> no, <laughs> no, I guarantee you I wouldn't be able to tell. And I also wouldn't care. I mean, I just wouldn't. So. <laughs> and I wouldn't worry about it. So, all right, that's my portion. Uh, that's the, uh, the seven bourbons you just absolutely have to own, period, end of discussion. <laughs> Fantastic. All right, so now we're going to have some fun because it's tailgating season. It is tailgating season. What did, what did you bring to us today, uh, Well, you know, so everyone, you know, likes to tailgate with beer, but I, um, I'm not a big, huge fan beer drinker and you know I can only drink so much cider so I really enjoyed the uh, evolution of canned wines um, you know it's it's everything you want it to be people are always asking me for half bottles of wine one 12 ounce can of wine is a is a half bottle um, it's 375 milliliters um, it also is easier to store. Uh, you can put it into your cooler better. You don't have to worry about glass um, or having a bottle opener. Um, you can bring it uh, to your tailgate. You can go hiking. You can go to a movie with it. Um, actually, I've been to a couple of movie theaters that have started um, giving, not giving out, but selling canned wine, and, uh, yeah, canned, I mean, it's two glasses of wine, so be, it's not like beer, you have to be careful, you have to self-regulate on it, um, but yeah, canned wine is really, um, kind of taking off, and it's really kind of, um, done, uh, taking a little bit of the market share in wine this past summer, so, you know, I have my particular favorites and my thoughts about it. Um, I think white and rosés go very well in cans. Um, however, 75% of what you um, experience with red wine is actually through the nose. So it's a little bit counterintuitive um, for red wine, but there are some good red wine canned options out there. Um, we uh, met a, a, a couple of young men um, out of Ohio, uh, and they started the man can movement. <laughs> man can. Um, and so these guys have some of the highest rated canned wines in the canned wine scene. Um, and they have a red, a white, and a rosé. Um, I My favorite is probably their rosé, and I drank at least two cases of it this summer <laughs> in my, you know, shows and um, hikings and just kind of hanging out, you know, uh, Mowing the lawn, that's a that's something that you can do. Bust me out. Bust me out of can that red. <laughs> so right. let me let me ask you a question then on this emerging category. Um, so like when you open one of these, you are definitely committing, I think, to drinking half a bottle of wine. Which You are. You ask my wife and I. We don't <laughs> we don't open a bottle of wine if we're not committed to drinking at least half the bottle. Right. Uh, so that's not a problem, but I do think, I do wonder about like this category and like what you said, like the uh, like the dosing or the amount that somebody wants in a particular sitting because the normal, uh, the normal glass of wine is what, five ounces? So mm -hmm. it's just what people are used to and can they go from that to this? So it's actually two glasses of wine plus an extra two ounces. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, what what do you what do you think about that? Because I think that's an interesting question. Um, that's probably the biggest complaint I have about canned wine is that people kind of forget that it is two glasses of wine, and so they're drinking it like you drink Coke, drinking like a diet Coke. Um, 
drinking, you know, even some beer and you're just so used to it being like either a low or alcohol. I mean, these are normal, like this is a 12.5% wine. Um, I mean, that's, yeah, look at there, it says right there, two, two, base, two and a half glasses. So, I mean, you have to kind of space it out, slow it down a little bit. Um, that's, that's kind of the, the biggest hurdle I think for canned wine right. is it is the, it's the self-regulation. But if you are going to a concert or you are like finishing a hike, then the full can is really not a problem, right? I mean, right. if you're going to sit there for a concert, as long as you've got a koozie, it's going to stay cold. You can nurse that. You can nurse that for an hour, hour and a half mm -hmm. and the same amount of time that you'd be drinking two glasses of wine, right? Yeah. Or 20 minutes or whatever <laughs> or if you have to you know slam it before you get into the show which right. you know happens but um well then you know it's a cheap date at that point <laughs> yeah i think the other part of it is there's a, there's something psychological about drinking you know a non-carbonated beverage from a can I mean, that's right. kind of, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, so we have these Andre cans. Andre just came out with cans. <laughs> but if you poured this into a glass, obviously. Yeah. If you poured it into a glass for somebody, nine, nine out of ten people would not immediately go, ooh, what's the deal here? Yeah. No, Is this from a can? They would not. You know. wouldn't know. Yeah, you wouldn't know. It's just, um, and that's why I kind of prefer the, uh, the sparkling wines and the rosés, just because they have that crispness to them that like really translates well to a can. Whereas I feel like red wines are maybe a little bit too heavy, but right. that's just my personal opinion. But This red wine's really good though. Yeah, I mean it has a little fizz to it too, like just a little bit, just to make it like a little bit more, I think, acceptable to people's brains. Um, yeah, and I think they did a great job you know, it's, yeah. it was kind of like our, our canned wine of the summer. Um, cool. Although there are a lot of options out there now. I'll open one of the sparklings. Let's try some sparkling yeah. wine. <laughs> I've totally wanted to try this Brut Rosé forever. Okay. <laughs> this is the Andre Brut Rosé. What's the price point on this? Uh, this, I believe, is like three ninety nine. I believe. Okay. Maybe. But yeah, here you yeah, go. You try. Uh -huh. You try, try first. It. Try it. Yeah, so four bucks, and I, I'm also seeing these in a lot of grocery. Not bad, everyone. In a lot of grocery kind stores, of <laughs> where it's kind of like a grab and go situation. Where mm -hmm. if you want to try something, it's a little bit of a, um, uh, what do you call those purchases? Oh my God. Impulse. <laughs> impulse buy. Yes, <laughs> it's an impulse buy at a grocery store um, on a checkout aisle. So what do you think? I, I'm actually very impressed with the Andre can. I don't. I That's good. It's yeah. sweet. It's fruity. Yeah, it's like everything you want it to be. It's kind of refreshing. Yeah, <laughs> these aren't cold. No, they're not cold. But it's really good. But yeah, it's uh, it's definitely gonna get you to where you want to go. <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of it got good this. Doing it it kind of has this like sort of beer esque throwback label to it, with, like that gold color. So I think if you're you should see the koozies that come with it. I think if you're drinking this, <laughs> I think if you're with a bunch of other beer drinkers, you'll be right at home. Yeah. And you'll be getting there much faster because that's... It's 9.5%. 9. 9. But if you're looking at like <laughs> brewed IPAs or whatever, most of those are like in the 9% range now. So <laughs> you're not far off the mark. All right, let's open one more. All right, so then we also have um, the Archer Root Spritzes, which I they're, they're only 90 calories. Um, and they're a lower ABV, so it's only 6%. Um, this is something I actually just discovered about like a month ago because of sample bottles or sample cans that were left in my office um and this is actually a sparkling red wine which i haven't had this one but i know that the white wines are actually really good and they're really refreshing without having all, all that alcohol so you can get some stuff done <laughs> in the afternoon what <laughs> all right try that one is it good yeah oh that's surprising you because like sparkling it's, reds? Because it's almost like a really deep rosé. So it has like those kind of raspberry, strawberry flavors to it with a little bit of spritz. It's a little bit heavier than a rosé, but it's not as heavy as a red wine. I've and, been pushing for the winter rosé forever. Yeah. I don't know how we do that, but <laughs> somebody's right. got to do it. That, that, would be a, that would be like the winter rosé. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> yeah, I think this is a trend that's still 
a little bit on the young side, mm -hmm. and we'll see how it develops. Obviously, you know, this package, the can itself is a, is a commodity. It's an existing piece of hardware that's out there, and it's, it's relatively affordable, and it's in abundance. Unless right. aluminum tar tariffs go crazy or whatever, but, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's out there, and it's something that, um, for whatever reason, hadn't, hadn't caught on, but I think with the craft beer movement, kind of laid the groundwork for people wanting to drink more things out of cans, it's a convenient recyclable package. You, you can, can go to the pool with it. You, you can, can yep. hang it on your yacht with it. You can do fun labels, and I think fun uh, labels. Yeah, I think I think it's good for wine to branch out and get away from the bottle and cork, which has to be it's, one of the most outdated. <laughs> it's an things. imperfect seal. I mean, yeah, it, one it of has, most yeah, had a purpose, right? <laughs> but, but we're, we've we've. Um, the technology has like evolved, and so self enclosures and cans and it's like the boxes. growler. Yeah, you know, if you're drinking <laughs> beer from a growler, you obviously don't know anything about beer. It is the it's literally the worst vessel on the and, planet. And like, you can drink a whole growler. No, no, no. Here, <laughs> let me like let me take your beer. I'm gonna shake it up. I'm gonna make sure that most of the carbonation is gone. I'm going to make sure that it's not as cold as it should be, and then I'm going to serve it to you in, in my bar called Growler Bar. Nobody would go there because all the beer would taste terrible. And yet, all I see people on, I see people on the weekends rolling up to the craft breweries with their growlers like, I get it. So, like, it's fresh or whatever, and the beers are different. You can't always get them in the packages. So there's, there's like, some minor reasons to use a growler. But for the most part, Stay at the bar. Have the bar there. <laughs> the most fresh beer in the universe is is right there at the pub where it was made. Right. Like within a week. Why would you screw it up with a growler when you could just drink a beer there? Because then you have to deal with other people now. <sighs> well that's true. Other people are the worst. But But, but um, you guys are okay. Yeah. Fine. <laughs> so the can is obviously a perfect slash imperfect vessel for for multiple categories, um, but hopefully it'll spark some more creativity and the alcohol industry is uh, creative and follow the leader at the same time, I think. So if, yeah. so if somebody breaks through on an innovation, then everybody will do the same thing. Like, right. like a peach flavored whiskey <laughs> or name your, you know, <laughs> well, like whatever. Fireball. I mean, Fireball. name your, you know, Cinnamon. you know, Jameson. <laughs> When Jameson like broke through and became this like cultural thing, and every bar was serving it, and Irish. I mean, that's what took Irish whiskey to the next level. There's like 15, 20 Irish distilleries being built right now on the back of the success of that one item. So, innovation when it does work really helps move everything forward. So, but you know, for every Jameson, there's a thousand projects that totally failed just didn't make it and some are for good reasons and some are for <laughs> random no reason it's just the way it is so all right well kind of like celebrity celebrity spirits <laughs> yeah like celebrity spirits here we go yeah <laughs> bringing it back around all right so we've talked about the seven slash eight best bourbons in the universe we've laid down the law we've tasted wine andre in a can Think we've pretty much done our duty today. <laughs> I, you know i'm i'm excited for the kids at iu yeah. <laughs> get some old granddad and some andre in the can i feel like that's a i feel like we've made some really good suggestions <laughs> all right jill we out all right thank you cheers that was awesome eight hours